thanks for allowing me back in. Um, this is, I, I didn't, evidently, you know, I didn't, I didn't screw up too much the, the first time around, so, uh, so I was invited back. Um, but before we get started, I just want to thank you for being out tonight. I mean, I, I don't know if your advent is going like my advent, but it is flying. Um, and there's a lot of stuff. This is, yeah, it's, it's a busy time of year. Um, as I mentioned, this is exam week. I know Jeff's, Jeff's finishing up. Um, Jeff's got more students than I do. So, um, uh, but um, I, so as much as you may enjoy this interaction tonight, just be glad you're not one of my students. Um, I just finished... Freshman class, Jeff, 174 question final exam. Wow. Yeah, 174 questions. <laughs> Cla but I, but I, did, I did grade them. I, I did grade them. They're all, they're all graded, Jeff. Class average, 80. Yeah, they knocked it out of the park. They did, they did really, really well um, for freshmen. So I'm very, I'm very proud of them. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's going on. Uh, we've got some job searches. We've got candidates that I've been interviewing um, this week. Uh, and, um, and then we're gearing up for uh, some service trips to Guatemala. So my wife is leaving on Sunday to take our first team of 11 students to, um, to Guatemala. She'll be there for a week. She'll get back on Christmas Eve, if all goes well. Um, we have Christmas to New Year's together, and then I leave the day after New Year's to take the second team down to down to Guatemala. So, um, in fact, Tracy Winkler, who is part of this group, is is going uh, on the first first trip. So, um, yeah, so a lot of lot of stuff going on uh, in addition to the the regular holiday stuff, but. All that said, I know you all have busy lives as well and things going on, and, and I appreciate your commitment to being here tonight, um, uh, despite all, all, that's, all that's going on. So, um, so thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I know we um, uh, usually, the, the way the, the format is, uh, is, is we do kind of interactive stuff towards the end. Well, we're going to do interactive stuff at the beginning instead. So, um, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you have a clean sheet of paper or, or if you don't, you, you can write it in your mind or whatever. Um, I'm going to ask you, just as, as a way of starting things, um, and, and I was laughing about this question. Um, I want you to rank order, all right? And again, this is just your own opinion. I want you to do this on your own. Um, the most important of Jesus' followers. Give me a top five in ranked order. Who is the most important of Jesus' followers? Yeah, it's a tough question. And I know pastorally we're not supposed to do this, right? The least is supposed to be the greatest, and the greatest is the least. So this isn't a pastoral assignment. This is, a, this is just an academic assignment. This is just a thought process assignment. But if you had to rank them in order of importance, and I'm going to look at importance, okay? Um, in your mind... Who are who's the who are the most important followers of Jesus of all time? Go ahead and, and rank order. Give me the top five. So if you have a sheet of paper or if you have your phone, you could write it out on your phone. Think about that. Of all time, yes. Who are the most important followers? Who, who would you, who would be your top? Five? I'm curious as to who your number one would be. Um, but who would be your top five? Take a few minutes and. And think about that. There's no right or wrong here, so don't don't worry about that. Yeah. Wait. We'll, we'll wait. We'll just wait. Go ahead and write write them out first, and then we'll we'll discuss it. <laughs> and I know we have. We have we have a number of we have a number of theologians in our midst, so I'm kind of curious as to as to what they would say. Who would be your who would be your top five? Don't Google it. Don't Google it. Don't you can't use a chat a GT or whatever. It's yeah. So you gotta. Who would be your top five? In order. <laughs> <laughs> Setting Father Seamus into an existential crisis here. It's okay. 
of all time. Yes, yes. Who are your top five of all time? Top five most important followers of Jesus. Do you have five names? Okay, all right. As long as you have five names. That's okay. That's all right. Give you another. No. <laughs> as long as you can read it. No, no, no. Just just rank order them. Okay. Just rank order them. I know Father Seamus is going to appear in that number somewhere, but <laughs> but the question is, do you put him at number one? Do you put him at number three? Is he is he five? Oh, where 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 is he in there? That's the, the that's the question. Take another minute or so. Finish it up. We'll, just, just, we'll wait for everybody to finish. I'm going to let you answer that question however you want. I'll let you define importance, but top five most important followers of Jesus of all time. There's some good thinking that's going in. Okay, is everybody done with that thought assignment? Okay, all right. So what, who, who would like to share their list? Who would, okay, who do you, what do you got? I don't know, Mary, Peter and Paul had a hard time deciding whether they would be two, three, but Mary and Paul would go first and Peter first. Oh, my St. Augustine and St. Thomas the Grants. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, Mary, who's number two? You've got to make a decision on who's number two. Paul. Oh, you're putting Paul before Peter. Oh, no, I didn't. Wow. <laughs> who's, who's number two? Okay, Peter, Paul, Augustine, and Aquinas. Okay, who else? What do you got? Who's your number one? Paul. Paul. Really? Okay, all right. Because he spread the news of the gospel. Okay. That's my reason. Okay. And Peter is the father of the church. Mm -hmm. And then we have Mary Magdalene, who is close to Jesus. We have Matthew and John. Matthew and John, the evangelists. Yes. Okay. All right. Do you want to share your list? Yeah, mine is Peter, John, and Paul, Mary, Jesus' mother, and then Mary, Mary Madeline. And then Mary Madeline. Okay, good. Yes, I uh, one is St. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Yep. Second is Peter, yep. the first book. Third is St. Paul, the evangelist. And fourth, St. John the Evangelist, and then John, John Baptist, the last one. John, you're the first one that's mentioned John the Baptist so far. Okay. All right. I wondered if he was going to make it in. Yeah. All right. Who else would like to share their list? Yes. Mine's a little different, okay? I have Peter. Yeah. John. Yeah. And then I said Augustine's family, because it kind of clumped them together, because, you know, they okay. kind of interacted with Monica. <laughs> Okay, okay, all right. And then I put St. Mary of Cash because she's my favorite. And then. Because <laughs> she's my favorite, okay, yeah, yeah. She's like, because it's my favorite. And then I'm my mom. Okay. <laughs> Which is obviously important, yeah, important personally. Right, from my perspective, yeah, because she sure. really was the grounding force in For you, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. Who else? Who else like to share? Sure. Funny, I'm like, I'm in this. We did almost the same one. What was your thought? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So I like, and in fact, I put John the Baptist, and I crossed it out and put Mary Magdalene. Me too. Really? So you thought Mary Magdalene was? Uh, I put Mary, Peter, Paul, John, the evangelist, and then I was like, oh, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene. <laughs> So Mary Magdalene made the cut and John the Baptist did not. Yeah. <laughs> Poor John the Baptist. <laughs> not the first time he's been cut. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't us. It went, over, it went over most people's heads. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Anybody else? Jeff, what'd you put? Uh, well, my, similar, my list was similar, but I, I started with Peter, Paul, and John, and then because I'm a fairly good Catholic, I was slow in the uptake with Mary. <laughs> so, so Mary, and then I had an arrow putting her first, so nice. and then I went with James. 
Okay. Oh, James. James. I didn't mention that. Okay. All right. All right. Anybody else want to share theirs? Amy, what'd you do? Mine was literally the exact same as Father Sheen was like, Christ, I'm trying to do that. Is really? Yeah. It was about personal. It's almost the same as the But I don't know. I was unsure. I just thought so. Okay. All right. You two are thinking a little too much alike. Yeah. Um, good. All right. Um, uh, thank you for indulging me in that. That was a little, little thought experiment. Um, uh, it's sort of a, sort of a warm up to to tonight's topic, um, uh, which is Saint Paul, obviously. Um, uh, I, so be, before we we get into this, um, I I want to acknowledge uh, th this is the disclaimer. Um, that I'm coming at this topic as a biblical scholar. I'm not coming at this topic as a systematic theologian. Uh, biblical scholarship is that's that's my training, and and so I'm, I, that's the lens that I'm I'm looking at um, that this information from. I uh, at, at St. Joe's I teach an entire course on the life and letters of St. Paul, and in thinking about this um, this this presentation tonight. It was sort of daunting. Like, how do I how do I distill an entire semester long college course into one meeting? Uh, and, and that, and that's daunting because we cover a lot of information uh, over the over the semester. So, um, so if I if, if it seems a little disjointed, hopefully you'll you'll forgive me for for that because there's there's so many there's so many neat aspects of it that I that I want to introduce, but um, we'll we'll do what we can. Um, uh, I, and also, let me be a little bit autobiographical in terms of my um, my, my relationship to Saint Paul as it is. Um, so when I was growing up, my, my mom was was very Catholic, came from a very Catholic family. My dad uh, came more from a Protestant family, more kind of evangelical Protestant family. So um, so I kind of had a foot in, in both worlds. Um, and in the in the evangelical Protestant tradition, you know, they, they talk a lot about your your per that, that's a, that's a big um, you know big emphasis, um, and so you know growing up uh, that that you know that was something that I, I heard a lot of, and so was really like okay well I, I want to get to know Jesus more, and so what better way of getting to know Jesus more than than to read your Bible right. Um, and so the Gospels was really kind of the the genre of preference for me. Uh, figured if I wanted to get to know Jesus, I should really get to know the Gospels. And so I really kind of dug deep into into the Gospels. And and the more I you know I, I came up through Catholic schools um, from from fourth grade up through high school. And then at high school, I, I actually went to a Protestant school, uh, uh, Hope College, um, which had an excellent biblical studies department and allowed me to really dive deep in, into the scriptures uh, there um, and, and was able to really do some, some deep dives in, into the Gospels, which, which was kind of my first love. Um, as I got into the Gospels and, and learned more about the Gospels, uh, it dawned on me that to really understand the Gospels, you really got to go back and understand the Old Testament, right? And, and all that's the backstory, right? That's the origin story. Um, and so, so my my first love was the Gospels, and then that kind of drew me into the into the Old Testament study. And uh, when I went on to graduate school at, at Marquette, I was able to really do some deep dives into into some of those Old Testament books, um, as as well as the Gospels. So that was sort of my formation. Um, and then, like, okay, so what's left of the Bible, right? Uh, where does Paul fit in? Like, the, like Paul was just sort of this like outlier that I never really came to know much about. Never really came to appreciate a whole lot. Like for me, it was more the Gospels and the Old Testament. And um, and again, as a biblical scholar, I felt like that was that was kind of a piece that was missing. And and Paul was sort of always this um, enigmatic character that. That Catholics seem to have a kind of a distant relationship to, and I think that's because of because of the Protestant Reformation. Actually, um, you know, as you're as you're going through um, when 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 Luther and Calvin had their issues with the Church, they leaned heavily into Paul, and and sort of as a response to that, it seems like Catholics sort of shied away from from Paul, um, and, and so Paul was kind of, kind of left out in the in the in the cold here a little bit. Um, 
And so I, I really wanted to, just, just for my own personal sake, but also for my professional sake, I really wanted to get to understand Paul better. So, um, so a number of years ago, I applied, uh, while I was teaching at St. Joe's, I applied for a, um, for a grant uh, and, and got it. It was a competitive grant. It was a very generous grant to take, to take three years. So this was 2010, 2011, 2012. That, that, that nice period before the pandemic, when, it, when life was life was good, um, uh, to, to take three years and basically to follow in the footsteps of Paul, to go where Paul went, and to try to really try to understand him better. Um, and so uh, the the grant was approved and very generously supported. So in 2010, um, I, I went to to Israel. Uh, and and was able to kind of start there. In 2011, I was in um, Turkey and Greece, again, following, try, trying to hit as many spots where, where Paul was. And then in 2012, I was in uh, Malta and then and then in Rome. Um, and during that time, it was it was really enriching and it really opened up my eyes to um, to who Paul was and what he was trying to do. He is a he is a very complicated individual. Um, and, and he can be a little intimidating. His theology can be a little intimidating. His his life story can be a little intimidating. Um, but to try to wrap my mind around who he was, and and I I really came to a much deeper appreciation for for who who he was and, and what he did. Um, I feel like in Catholic circles um, we put a lot of emphasis on Mary, obviously. Um, and, and I was wondering how many people had Mary at the at the top of the list, right? Because technically, right, theologically, Dulia, right, the the um, the the honor and respect we show to the saints, she's she's hyper Dulia, right? She's she's the she's the super honor and, and respect. Um, so she's kind of in a in a class by herself. Uh, and and obviously, as Catholics, we put a lot of emphasis on Peter, right, as the first pope, as as the rock, as the head of the church. Um, and so, and again, in, in going to, to Italy and going to Rome, uh, Peter's all over. You go to, you go to St. Peter's. It's all about, it, it's all about Peter. I mean, that's where the Vatican is and, and it's, and it's, it's right there. Um, and then, you know, Paul again, kind of gets sort of, he's sort of off to the side a little bit. Um, and I, in doing the, the studies and the research that I've done, I, I really feel like, um, you know, as a Catholic, we sort of undervalue him and, and sort of uh, underappreciate him. I don't know if I, when Father Seamus mentioned that we're studying Paul tonight, I, I don't know if he hadn't said that, would Paul have made your top five lists? I don't know. Uh, or or was, it, was it because you knew that this is what we were talking about tonight? I, I don't know. Um, but hopefully, uh, if I can do anything this evening, it's to, it's to enrich your appreciation for for what Paul brings to the table uh, with with regard to with regard to our faith, okay. So that's that's my goal, um, okay. Uh, and that's that's my backstory, um, okay. So let's let's. I mean, again, there's so many facets of Paul, but um, but let's let's just get kind of a, a, a general outline of of who he is and, and kind of his his biography, kind of his life story. And I know a lot of you um, probably know this, some of this already. So, so let's. And again, I want to be, I want to be interactive. I don't just want to be lecturing at you all night. Um, uh, so let's let's do this kind of dialogically. Um, so, where did Paul start? Where was Paul born? Tarsus, right? Tarsus. Um, where is Tarsus? Okay, yeah, southeast Turkey. Uh, it's not it's not far from the Syrian border, uh, and and I I got a chance to uh, well actually yeah yeah I got a chance to to visit Tarsus when when I was there. Um, if if you go to Tarsus, there is a archaeological site that supposedly is Paul's house, or at least according to tradition, that's where he was raised, um, and and you know you can see the it's kind of cool. They have a plexiglass covering over what's now at least 10 feet below you can see the where where the house floor would have been and and some of the some of the cups and implements that they found there there's also a well on site uh that they assume that that was Paul's well is what they call it and and even to this day you can 
you can bring your bottle, you can fill it up with water from Paul's well. So I, I actually have water from, from Paul's well, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, okay, uh, but back when he was born, he wasn't known as Paul, he was known as? Saul. Okay, good. So it's Saul of Tarsus. That's, that's who he starts as. Um, okay, what do we know about his parents? <laughs> okay, do you know their names? Yeah, we don't have much information about his parents at all. Um, we we presume they were. I mean, Paul is Jewish, and and presumably would have been raised in a Jewish household. Um, we do know one thing, though. We uh, that we kind of summarize or, or um, assume based on some of the information about him. His father was most likely what a merchant. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we don't know that for sure, but we do know one thing for sure because Paul has it as a birthright. Well, he is Jewish, but it, but more than that, yes, he's a Roman citizen. He's a Roman citizen, and that was a little unusual for Jews to be Roman citizens. Okay, most Jews were not Roman citizens, so that means most likely his father was a Roman citizen, and how he got that citizenship, we don't know. But that was passed along to Paul. And that was important, and that will come into play in, in, our, in our understanding of him. Um, so again, we don't know his parents' names. Uh, we don't know much about them, but we do know uh, most likely his father was a Roman citizen. That's how he gets his, his uh, citizenship. Okay. Readings, the readings uh, for today. No, I guess this wasn't covered in the reading. Never mind. Um, this will test how well you know the New Testament. Um, who did he study under? He does mention this in one of his letters, but it's not in Romans. Yeah, Gamaliel, um, who's, a, who's a very famous Jewish um, rabbi at the time, uh, very, very well known, very, very well respected. Um, so Paul had a, had a really solid education, a solid Jewish education under, under uh, Gamaliel. Um, uh, as far as we know, probably spoke both Hebrew and Greek, uh, and um, you know would would have been um, you know again well educated. Uh, all right, what did he do for a living? What was his what was his skilled trade? Anybody know what he did? Well, that was his sort of affiliation, sort of his religious affiliation. But but you don't do that for a living. You gotta you gotta you gotta make a living somehow. What was his trade? Anybody know? Okay. What was Peter's trade? Okay. See, everybody knows Peter, right? Okay. This is an, this is an example. All right. So what did Paul do? I know Father Shavis knows, but <laughs> does anybody else in the class know? Jeff, do you know? He was a tent maker. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Um, yeah, he mentions that kind of off, off hand of them. Um, all right. Uh, and then a lot of the information, so obviously a lot of the information that we have about St. Paul comes from two sources. What are, what are those sources? Where we know about Paul's life and exploits. How do we how do we know anything about Paul? Where would we find that? You you did your readings, right? You did. <laughs> okay, Acts of the Apostles gives us most of the auto, auto, most of the biographical information about uh, that we know about about Paul. The other source would be his writings, his own letters, and and on occasion on his own letters he will write about himself and some of the things he's he's been through. So. Um, so those those are kind of the two the two sources, and sometimes those sources kind of contradict each other, um, and when they do, uh, you know the 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 biblical scholars tend to lean towards his letters, in terms of okay, well, what really happened, uh, you know. Uh, well, one example is kind of this this dust up that they had um, when Peter goes to Antioch and and has this. 
how he treats the Gentiles in Antioch. Um, in Acts, it, it's kind of glossed over, but in Paul's letters, I mean, it's 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 a big dust up. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's one that'd be one example. Um, okay, uh, let's see. So he, yeah, so so he's he's Jewish. He's he's very um, zealous about his his Jewish faith. Um, he's he's very involved. He's again, he's a tent maker. Um, and then, kind of where we next see him in at least in the Book of Acts, it, what what's he famous for doing? Persecuting Christians, right? Persecuting Christians, yeah. Um, so, and Paul mentions this. Paul himself mentions this that he persecuted Christians. But Paul never really goes into depth in terms of why he was persecuting Christians. What's that? Well, yeah, so what exactly was it about the Christians that he was so offended by? What exactly did he disagree with? That question's never, never officially answered. But we can kind of summarize, uh, you know, most, most people think that, that the real offense was that Paul felt like these Christians were following, not that Jesus was the Messiah, I mean, that wouldn't necessarily be a heresy, but if Jesus was making himself the Son of God, that would, that would cross the line in, in the Jewish mind, right? Um, and, you know, that, that may be well why he, he felt like that was, that was blasphemy, right? Um, and he wanted to put an end to that. So uh, again, according to Acts, we know that he had he had permission from the from the Jewish authorities to go around and round up these Christians and to bring them in for trial and to bring them in for for persecution. And again, according to Acts, he was he was there when when Stephen was being stoned. Um, so he was you know he was he was an active participant in some of this stuff. Um, okay, what happens next? <laughs> What happens next to his life? Okay. All right. So yeah, this is uh, this is where the big the the dramatic scene uh, the the change in his life comes. Um, so as he's going from place to place, rounding up these Christians and, and persecuting them, arresting them, persecuting them, um, he's going, I believe, from Jerusalem to to Damascus on the road to to Damascus. Um, and again, the, it's interesting, the story appears, I, I think, three times, at least three times in Acts. And then Paul himself also writes about it in, in, his, in his letters. And again, each, each time the story is told, there's slightly different uh, details involved. Um, but the upshot of it is he, he's going from one place to the next. Um, and he is, he's kind of knocked down by this bright light. And he hears this voice. And it says, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, and he's like, who are you? And the voice is like, well, I'm Jesus. I'm the risen Jesus. Knock it off. Um, and, uh, and, and as a result, he is left, he's left blinded by, by the encounter. Um, so here he is, you know, on the road to Damascus. He was heading to Damascus to, to, you know, round up these Christians in Damascus. That's that's why he's going there, and um, and all of a sudden he's he's kind of left helpless. I mean, he's 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 blind. He doesn't know what to do. Um, so he makes his way to Damascus. And he makes his way to these these Christians. Uh, Ananias is is where he goes. Um, and you can imagine, like here's so here. <laughs> Here's Paul knocking on their door, right? They know about him. They know he's a persecutor of Christians. They're like, don't open the door to that guy, right? But you know, they, the Holy Spirit leads them to to uh, to open open the doors and, and let him in. Um, and, and he tells his story, and and Ananias, to, to his credit, takes him in, uh, prays over him, and and he regains his his sight. Um, and as a result of this dramatic encounter. He has a very dramatic conversion, um, really 180. I mean, going from from persecutor of Christians to to really believing in Jesus and believing that Jesus has risen, and this guy this guy is who they're say, who these Christians are saying he is. Um, 
and so he does. Yeah, he, he does a, a complete a complete one eighty. Um, he then he kind of bounces around uh, for a couple of years, but makes his way down to Jerusalem, uh, and you, you sort of have to read between the lines here. But the you know the early Christians. The Jewish Christians are like, I, you know, what do we do with this guy, right? Like, like he, he seems to really want to be involved with Christianity, but like, I don't, like, he's rogue. I mean, he's, you know, he was persecuting Christians and now he wants to be one. And, you know, what do we, what do we do with him? So, um, you know, they, they, they talk to him and, and they, uh, they decide, okay, well, Peter, Peter's going to go to the, to the Jews and then we'll send Paul to the, to the Gentiles. Um, so Paul begins his his missionary journeys. Uh, those are there, there's famous three series of three missionary journeys. He's all over the place. I mean, I did I didn't <laughs> I didn't appreciate how far and wide Paul traveled until I was there and traveled in his footsteps. And I mean, he was it's amazing how far he got. Um, it, I mean, it's 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 incredible. Uh, to, to, I mean, to retrace his steps. It's ambitious even today. Even today in a car, it's, it's ambitious. But, but to do that on foot, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So he starts, he starts going out and he starts uh, preaching and teaching. Um, he originally starts at the Jewish synagogues, right? And he's expecting to convert the Jews, and a lot of the Jews just aren't having it. They're just they're just not listening. They they you know they're just not accepting it. But as he's at these synagogues, there are these Gentiles. And again, this this was something that I didn't appreciate until until I got to know the story more. Um, but in the Roman Empire, there would have been these these Gentiles who were monotheists. So even though you know most of the Romans were polytheists and they worshipped you know they worshipped Zeus. That were that believed that there was only one God. Um, they just weren't sure what to call him, but but they were they were attracted to that. So they were sort of attracted to Judaism, and they liked to go to the synagogue. They couldn't go in, but they liked to they liked to hear what was being read at the synagogue, uh, because that that sort of answered what they were looking for in a way, um, because it was talking about this one God instead of this pantheon. And so as Paul was going to these synagogues. Um, you know, the Jews weren't, weren't on board with what he was saying, but he picked up a lot of these Gentiles who were like, hey, tell us more. Tell us more about this faith. Um, and so, you know, they, they, were, they were attracted to this. Um, the question then became, and this, and this, was, the, this was the big question, um, and if you want to understand Paul, this is the one thing you got to understand. The question became, what do you do with these Gentile converts? What do you do with these folks? Um, how, do you, how do you make them Christian? Because prior to this, all of the Christians were Jews. Jesus was Jewish. John the Baptist was Jewish. Mary and Joseph were Jewish. All the disciples were Jewish. Right? So they were, they were following their Jewish practices, and they didn't see Christianity necessarily as something different than Judaism. They saw it as the fulfillment of Judaism, um, and in line, in keeping with Judaism. And now all of a sudden you had these Gentiles who were showing up. And the question was, okay, well, if, if they want to be Christians, what does that mean? What does that look like? They don't have this background that we have. They don't have this tradition that we have. They don't have this inclusion that we have. They're not... Are they part of the chosen people or not? Can they be or not? That was, that was the burning question of the day. Um, and so obviously, you know, Paul, Paul was, was a big advocate for them. Um, and between his first and second missionary journeys, um, it, it came to a head. And they had to make a decision. You know, what was this going to look like? Uh, this church at Antioch was, was booming. Um, and it was filled with a lot of Gentiles, and, and they, they wanted to know, like, what do we have to do to be Christians? And so, so Paul and a delegation went down to Jerusalem, and they met with the, you know, they met with the disciples in Jerusalem, and they're like, look, can we, can we, make, can we make this easy for them? Can we, can we give them a shortcut to this faith, or do they have to take on all of, all of Judaism? Uh, so this became the Jerusalem Council. This is a, this is a, 
key turning point in, in Christianity. Um, and we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. Um, uh, so they, they have this council and, and they make a decision, uh, and they basically take away a lot of the obstacles to becoming, to becoming Christians. Um, uh, and, and they, they basically end up siding with, with Paul and what Paul is recommending. Um, uh, after that council, it's good news for the Gentiles. They're really happy. Paul continues to do his missionary journeys. He does number two, he does number three. Um, he makes his way back to Jerusalem and, uh, some of the, now some of the Jews in Jerusalem are not happy with, with Paul, um, and they're because they feel like he's spreading this this heresy as well, um, and so he gets into trouble there. He gets he gets there's a there's a big dust up. He gets arrested. He's under house arrest for a while, um, and then eventually he so he pleads his case to Rome as a Roman citizen. He's like, all right, well I'm a Roman citizen. I I want to I want to I want to I want to plead my case to Caesar, um, and they're like. Oh, you're a Roman citizen, and, and he's like, yeah. And so they're like, oh, okay. Well, I guess to Caesar you want to go. To Caesar you're going to go. So, um, so they ship him off to to Rome as he's on the way over there. Big shipwreck. Um, he ends up in, in the island of Malta. Uh, and I will say, you know, traveling to Malta, I, I really enjoy traveling to Malta. When you go to the Vatican, when you go to Rome and, and the Vatican. Um, it's all about it's all about Peter. Uh, it's all about Peter. Uh, but when you go to Malta, it's all about Paul. Like they really embrace Paul. They they really appreciate everything's Paul oriented. So so it's kind of kind of neat to go there. Um, but he ends up getting shipwrecked, and then and then they get a new ship, and he ends up going to to Rome. He's under house arrest for a number of years, uh, and then uh, under under Nero, when when the persecution of Christians really ramps up. Uh, that's where he is. He is ultimately beheaded, um, and that's where that's where his story kind of kind of ends uh, in Rome. Um, part of his story, at least. Uh, so that's kind of his his basic biography. Uh, if if you were to read Acts, that's kind of that's kind of how that that plays out. Um, okay, I want to pause there. Do you have questions, just kind of about his life story so far? Anything that's not. Yeah. I had a couple uh, sort of feminist friends some years ago, and they were critical of Paul. Mm -hmm. in his, some of the things, I don't recall what they were, that he had written about women. Yeah. And uh, I went on a tour one time, and I was in Istanbul with a Turkish guide, and uh, this was mentioned. And he said, well, and he apparently had studied Paul. He said, Paul used to go around to the different amphitheaters in Cappadocia and all, all, all over the region and preach. And there was this one young woman uh, who was very interested in Paul. And she started to follow him from amphitheater to amphitheater and became a nuisance. She even dressed. This is the story that I got. I don't know if you've heard this story. Okay. She dressed as a young man. She cut her hair and dressed as a man huh. so that she could follow him. But his 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 followers, you know, would found her. They would try and kept trying to discourage her. And so some of his this was what was told to me. Some of his writings were based upon that nuisance factor that he. She was troublesome by interfering uh, with his religious, with his religious message. Okay. I don't okay. know if you've ever heard that story. I haven't heard that particular story, but Paul does allude to um, in, in his letters a thorn in his flesh, a thorn in his, in his side. Of evidently, it was either a physical ailment that was that was bothering him, and, and he kept praying to God to take it away and take it away and take it away, and God wouldn't take it away. Uh, God, he was. And he was convinced he just had to suffer with it, like this was God's will. He, he just had to deal with it. Um, and, and scholars are really divided on that. Was this was this a physical ailment that he was he was dealing with, or was this a particular individual that you know was really causing him was was really causing problems? Um, and so I don't know if that's connected to the story, but it sounds that that's kind of what it sounds like. Um, 
uh, when I, your, your story reminded me when I was an undergrad at, at, at Hope, um, one of the assignments that, <laughs> that, that I was assigned to as a, as a student, uh, we, had to, we had to put Paul on trial uh, you know, was was Paul a bigot or not? I mean, was was he anti-woman or not? Um, and 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 uh, we we had to plead the case, and then the rest of the class had to was the jury. Um, and I think it, I think it was a hung jury uh, because when you, when you look at you know when you look at his um, his writings, you know today some of those writings are kind of triggering. Um, you know, wives be submissive to your husbands, etc. Um, and, and that, that don't always play well to our, to our modern ears. And yet, some of the things that he writes would have been radical at the time, right? Um, uh, husbands, sub- submit to your wives as, as Christ, lo- or love your wives as, as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for it, right? Um, uh, or in Christ, there is no slave or free or male or female, right? Some of those would have been very radical at the time. So it's interesting, you know, when, when you start mining his letters, um, you see both and, uh, and you, you can see both and, and, and it's so it's yeah, it's kind of a, it was it was an interesting assignment to have to, to have to do. Um, yeah, good good point. Other other questions about about Paul's life? That's the. It's kind of the bio stuff. Um, all right. Uh, I think, you know, for me, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to distill. What, what, what does Paul really bring to the table? What's, what's uh, really, really significant about him? Uh, what, what makes him significant in, in, in the history of, of Christianity? Um, and I think it really comes down to kind of four, four things. Um, the first is something that I don't think Paul gets enough credit for. And I don't think, I, honestly, I don't think enough people will talk about. Um, and, and that's this. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I talk about this with, with my students. Um, and again, these are four, four very different aspects of Paul, but, but here's the first. See, I'll see what you think. Um, uh, Jesus' claim to be the Son of God really stands or falls upon one act. And that's his resurrection, right? Um, I mean, other people did miracles, right? Um, other people were wise teachers. Other people were prophets, okay? But as far as we know, in human history, that's a singular event. Only one person rose from the dead. I mean, called the shot. Said he was going to said he was gonna rise from the dead and then, and then, and then pulls it off, right? So... Um, so that I mean that's that's a big deal, right? Um, and and uh, and so I talked to my students. Well, so if Jesus really rose from the dead, then he probably really is who he said he was, right? And if he didn't rise from the dead, then he probably isn't who he said he was. So I mean, it really kind of stands or falls. That resurrection is is it's difficult to understate the the importance of that. Um, and so I talk, you know, I talk to my students. Um, it's okay to I tell them. It's okay to be skeptical of that, right? I mean, how many of you know anybody who's risen from the dead, right? I mean, it just doesn't happen. I mean, if I came in here and I said, uh, uh, you know, I, I I just got back from Burger King and and Michael Jackson, he's alive. I saw him. Okay, I saw him at Burger King. He's alive. Would any of you believe me? Right. I mean. Right? I mean, we apply a healthy skepticism to that, right? We know he's not alive. He, he died, right? Um, and, so, uh, and so, you know, I, I talked to my students about, about this act and this resurrection. Um, so, so it's okay to be skeptical about that. So we start going down the, the rabbit hole of, okay, so what are alternative explanations to this? You know, what else could have happened, right? Um, well, one easy explanation is that it was a hoax, right? That the disciples pulled off some sort of hoax. They went around telling people that Jesus rose from the dead, right? Um, claiming that they saw Jesus rise from the dead. They had a motive, right? They had a motive. I mean, they were locked into this Jesus guy. They were, they were gung-ho on this revolution, um, and all of a sudden, the authorities came and, and, and swept him up and took him and crucified him. Is that going to end the revolution? 
they would have been angry. They would have been, you know, discouraged. They, they may have wanted to get back at Rome or get back at the, at the Jewish leaders of the time. How do you get back at that? Well, you say, hey, guess what? You thought you could stop us. Guess what? You tried to crucify him, but now he's alive and we're continuing. We're, we're, we're still going. We're still going, right? Um, so they could have made this up, right? And most Christians would say, well, wait a minute. No, 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 because we, we know what's in here, right? But who wrote these accounts? But wait, they, were, you know, they saw Jesus. They saw Jesus rise. But again, who wrote these accounts? It's those same disciples. It's those same followers, right? They could have written anything, right? So... Have you heard this theory before? Well, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so this theory that the disciples maybe came and stole the body and hid it and went out and started lying, well, that's as old as the Gospels themselves, right? I mean, according to Matthew, that's what the chief priests were worried about was going to happen. So according to Matthew, they set the guards at the tomb so that it couldn't have happened. But who wrote that? One of Jesus' followers. So they could have said, oh yeah, they put 100 people at the tomb. There's no way we could have stolen the body, right? So all of a sudden that becomes suspect. Well, is that, I mean, is that a legitimate defense or not? Um, so so one, of the, you know, one of the questions was, you know, are the disciples lying or are they telling the truth? Now, one of the, one of the, one of the best defenses against that theory is that the disciples then went on to their deaths, right? Claiming that Jesus, that they saw Jesus. And the question is, why would you die for a hoax, right? If you knew it wasn't true, why would you die for a hoax? That's a, I think that's a good defense. But it's not airtight. Do you know people who have died for the wrong causes? People can get swept up in stuff. And and be and willingly die for the wrong causes. Um, I I'm glad this is a, a slightly I won't say older crowd, but a, a crowd my age. Um, uh, what what was it? The Hale Bob Comet? Do you, do you remember that? The 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 um, who was the uh, the religious cult uh, where where the comet came in and they thought that was going to usher in the end of the world, and so they. The Hellbop, yeah, the Hellbop comet, yeah, and so they all had their Nikes on, and they, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you guys remember this? Okay, all right, um, yeah. So, so people can willingly lay down their lives for sometimes wrong causes. So that's not exact. I mean, it's an argument. It's not an airtight argument, but it's, but it's, it's an argument. Um, the other, uh, the other theory is that. Um, and, and again, I've, I've heard this from, uh, from more modern skeptics. Um, the other theory is that Jesus, maybe Jesus somehow survived crucifixion. Okay. So he's up there on the cross, and they think he's dead. You know, he's kind of passed out. Um, they take him down from the cross a little prematurely. Remember, they don't break his legs, right? Okay. So they take him down from the cross a little prematurely. They put him in the tomb. They're going to get the rock for the tomb. Maybe Jesus comes too. Not necessarily. So he, well, we don't know how deep it went in, right? I mean, theoretically. So maybe he comes too. Maybe he makes his way out of the tomb. They go back. They're not going to check to see if a corpse is still there. A corpse isn't going to walk, go walking away. So they go and they roll the stone back. Jesus has a couple days to recuperate then appears to his disciples. Notice what he does. Look, I've still got my wounds. Hey, I'm hungry. How about a piece of fish? He's, still, he's very physical, right? Now they're convinced he's risen from the dead. They're willing to go out and die for it because they've experienced him. They've seen him. That becomes, yeah. So, explanations, 
right? Uh, now, obviously, there, there is there's an argument against that as well. Well, the argument would be what? I mean, there's a very logical argument against that. Where'd who go? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, okay. So the ascension becomes difficult. The ascension becomes a difficult thing to explain. Um, but what else? There's 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 more of a obvious, more of a logical problem to that. Yes. Okay. Right. And in hindsight, that's what they wrote into the Gospels. But what, so if Jesus doesn't die on the cross, if Jesus doesn't die on the cross, then what has to happen eventually? Okay, he has to die eventually. And as soon as he dies, what do you have? You have Jesus' corpse. And as soon as you have Jesus' corpse, you have the end of Christianity as we know it. I mean, Christianity's done. Um, and so that's kind of an argument against that. Um, you know, the Romans or the Jews could have easily produced that corpse. There's the end of Christianity. Or if, or if the disciples stumble upon it, they know, oh, he didn't really rise. He just survived execution, and then they, you know, they figure it out. Um, okay. Into this conversation, I think Paul doesn't get enough credit for this. Because how do you explain what happens to Paul, right? How do you explain what happens to Paul? In other words, let me, let me rephrase it this way. If I went out and I said, okay, guess what? I saw Mary. Mary appeared to me. Would you believe me? Some of you might, some of you might not, okay? Some of you might, some of you might not, right? Okay, maybe, maybe not. Um, what might skeptics say about my claim to see Mary? What might skeptics say about me seeing Mary? What might skeptics say about me seeing Mary? Do I benefit by seeing Mary? I'm a, I'm a professor in a, the, in a Catholic theological institution. Yeah, absolutely. I can benefit, yeah, if I, if I start selling this, if I want to promote Catholicism, if I want to promote theology, yeah, that, that may be, skeptics would say, well, he didn't really see her. He's just trying to. He's just trying to, uh, you know, increase enrollment over it in, in the theology program, right? Uh, yeah, uh, and and you could say the same of the disciples, and they were saying the same thing of the disciples. Well, yeah, these guys had already followed Jesus for three years of his life. I mean, they were they were already invested. They were heavily invested into him. They're heavily invested in him continuing. Into that context, what who? Be Witness. What you really want is an ideal witness. The disciples aren't that. Who would be the ideal witness? Exactly. Exactly. People who are absolutely convinced that it's a fraud. People that are absolutely convinced it's a fake. Um, uh, who's the famous, uh, the famous skeptic? Uh, uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, Dawkins. No. <laughs> Is that Stephen Hawking? I think it is Dawkins. Yeah, yeah. No, he's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be one thing if Mary appeared to me, but what kind of impact would it be if Mary appeared to him? And all of a sudden, he recanted everything that he said about Christianity. I'm wrong. I was an atheist. I was fighting this thing. But I saw Mary, and now I'm convinced this is legit, right? He would be the ideal witness, right? I wouldn't be the ideal witness. I've got something to gain for it. The disciples weren't the ideal witnesses. They've got something to gain for it. I don't think Paul gets enough credit in this respect. 
Um, you know, it's one thing for the disciples to go out and say, oh yeah, we saw him rise. But for Paul, someone who is so opposed to Christianity, who is so absolutely convinced that it was wrong, is going around persecuting Christians, for him to encounter the risen Jesus in such a powerful way and be absolutely convinced of what he encountered was real, I mean, that's, that's huge. Uh, and that becomes very difficult to explain in light of those alternative explanations, right? If the, if the disciples were just making this up, how do you explain what happens to Paul? If Jesus just survived execution, how do you explain what happens to Paul? He becomes kind of the ideal witness, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that role. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he physically experiences what, yeah, the results of that. Yeah, um, and, and, and that blindness is both a physical and, uh, and, 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 a, and a spiritual, right? He was spiritually blind as well. And now, you know, and now he can, and now he sees, now he sees the truth. Um, so I think that's one facet of Paul that I don't think gets talked about very much. Um, but I think it's, it's hugely important in the history of Christianity, that, that, that ideal witness to, to the resurrection. Um, other, question, other questions or thoughts on that? Yeah, Jeff. I, so I can imagine, I, I'll, I'll put my, my um, skeptic's hat on. Yeah. I can imagine the skeptic coming back maybe and saying something like, um, I mean, I, you know, we don't know everything about Paul's life. There's a lot of mysterious things. I mean, who, who knows? Blah, 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 blah. Like, how can, this is his, this is his account of himself. Yeah. And so, um, like, he's a smart guy. You, know, you can read what he, you can read his letters. You know, this is a pretty intelligent person. And so, in order to get himself into the community or have a certain clout or standing as a pretty good teacher or something, that, um, I, this, this objection would be defeated in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to maybe put on just sort of like my, my Phil J. Theus idiot sort of hat. Like, how, how can you trust Paul's account of himself? Well, it's so so it's two different accounts. You've got Luke's account, right, um, of, of this story happening. So according to Luke, he was a persecutor of Christianity. According to Luke, he you know he was all in against against Christianity. Um, so you have you have Luke's account, and then and then you also have that verified by by Paul's own admissions that that he was, um, you know, that he was he was dead set against it. And um, uh, I guess the question becomes, you know, what does he have to gain from it? Um, and and that's that's a that's a perfect segue because I want to. This is a good passage I want to read. Um, this is this is what Paul had to gain from it. Uh, from his conversion, I love this. Uh, uh, this is in Second Corinthians. Uh, he, so he talks about some of the things he's experienced uh, because he's been a, because he's converted to Christianity, um, <laughs> uh, and he's, he's talking about about weaknesses. Um, this is Second Corinthians uh, chapter eleven. Um, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? So he's talking about these others um, who, are, who are teaching the, the, in Corinth. Are they ministers of, of Christ? I am still more with far, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, far worse beatings, and numerous brushes with death. Five times at the hands of the Jews I received 40 lashes minus one. Jesus was whipped once. Okay, Paul's whipped five times. Um, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. He was literally stoned and left for dead. And then gets up and <laughs> goes on his way. Um, three times I was shipwrecked. We get, we get the one story of the shipwrecked in Acts. It, it has me curious as a biblical scholar. Okay, what, where were the other two? Uh, they, they never seem to get mentioned. Um, I, passed a night on, I passed a night and a day on the deep. So like he was shipwrecked like he was in the ocean for, for a, a, a day and a half uh, before he even made it to, to land. On frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own race, da dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and exposure, 
Um, apart from these things, there's the daily pressure upon me of, of my anxiety for all the churches. Um, so there's, that's, what, that's what Paul's signing up for, you know, uh, with, with this conversion. I mean, that's, and then we know, ultimately, he will, he will then be, and this is just when he's in Corinth. I mean, the story continues, right? <laughs> then he gets shipwrecked again, and then he, you know, and then he ends up being beheaded. I mean, he gets imprisoned and then, and then beheaded. So um, there, there's even more to come. Um, so, yeah, so Jeff, in answer to your question, I'd be like, oh, what's he gaining by it? I mean, he's not, he doesn't even seem to be getting notoriety. I mean, a lot of people just don't like him. And, and uh, you know, the Christians aren't exactly sure what to do with him. And, um, you know, his, his fellow Jews have kind of, you know, they, they, they've written him off. They, they don't want anything to do with him. So, um, yeah. Other questions? So Paul is, yeah, Paul is this ideal witness. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's the first aspect of, of Paul that I've really come to appreciate. Um, and again, I, I don't think he gets enough, enough credit in his role in, in that respect. Um, okay, the second, uh, let me just keep it an eye on my time, um, is his role, and this is what he's most famous for, his role as advocate for the Gentiles. Um, and, and this is, this is, this kind of defines his, his life's work. Um, the last time I was with you here, um, we spent some time talking about the covenant, about the, the Old Testament covenant, about, about Abraham and, and the law. Uh, I, I just want to review that um, in, in preparation for this section. Um, okay. So if we go back to the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament is the Old Covenant. It's the covenant between God and Abraham and the children of, of Abraham. Um, to be in the in-group, to be part of God's favored people, God's chosen people, what's required? What's required? What's the first thing that's required? Before that. What's the first thing that's required? If you want to be in part of the in-group, you want to sit at the cool table. Your lineage, yes. And what? So, what lineage is required? Okay, so you have to be. Yeah. Okay. So, number one, you have to have the, the right bloodline. Oops. Let's try another. One. Okay. So the chosen. People. Okay, so you've got to be of the right bloodline. You have to come from. You have to come from Abraham, right? Okay, any child of Abraham? <laughs> okay, through Isaac. So remember, Abraham had two offsprings. He had Ishmael and Isaac. And according to the Old Testament, according to the Jewish version of things, these are the descendants of Isaac, right? According to the descendants of Isaac, you've got to be a descendant of Isaac. No surprise there. Okay. Um, Abraham, Isaac, and any, yes. Okay, so Isaac has two kids, but not all of them. It's Jacob, yeah. Okay, so you've got to be of the right bloodline. And, and this Jacob, Jacob then will have 12 sons. Those become the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Okay, so in order to be at the cool kids' table, in order to be at the, at the, at the, um, in the in-group, you've got to be of the right bloodline. All right, that's the first thing. What's the second? Yes. Okay, circumcision. If you are male, you have to be circumcised. Okay, I should find this and read this. This is in Genesis. Uh, I'll get there. I'll get there. Okay, covenant of circumcision is in Genesis 17. Uh, I will read it to you. Uh, okay, it's God talking to Abraham. Um, 
in verse 9. God also said to Abraham, On your part, you and your descendants after you must keep my covenant throughout the ages. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you that you must keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, uh, and that shall be the mark of the covenant between you and me. Throughout the ages, every male among you, when he is eight days old, shall be circumcised, including your slaves. Um, Thus my covenant uh, shall be in your flesh as an everlasting pact. All right, they're literally, I mean, think of them as like being branded. They're being branded on, on the most sensitive part of their flesh. They're being branded for God, all right? Um, if a male is uncircumcised, that is, if the flesh of his foreskin has not been cut away, such a one shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. You want to be part of the covenant? You got to be circumcised. You're not circumcised, you're not part of the covenant. Pretty clear. Okay. Um, and this goes on and on. But uh, All right. Uh, so you got to be of the right bloodline. You have to be circumcised. All right. And then what else? What's the other requirement? And this is what we talked about last time I was here. As we go on into history, what becomes the next step of the covenant? Not the Ten Commandments. Okay. And what's the Torah? You have to follow what? How many are there? Do you remember? Oh, you guys are close. 600 what? 613. Yeah, 613 commandments. Good. 613 commands. Okay, you got to follow the law. All right, and this is where uh, this is where the Moses story, right? This is where God gives um, gives the Israelites the uh, uh, the laws. Um, so again, God says, "I will be your God; you will be my people." And and this is where God defines what it means to be His people. You want to know? Here you go. Boom! Your six hundred thirteen laws. They govern every aspect of your life. They govern what you can wear. They govern what you can eat. They govern how you worship, when you worship. They govern how you conduct social activity. They, can, they govern uh, crime and punishment. I mean, there's all, sorts of, there's all sorts of laws. We talked about those last time, those 613 commands. Um, okay, so this is it. I mean, this is, this is the Old Covenant. This is the Old Testament. This, this, is, this is what defines the chosen people. Okay. Um, when Christianity appears on the scene, those original, Jesus and his disciples, how, what happens next? Jesus and his disciples, are they, are they all of the bloodline? The original Jesus and his disciples? Yes, they are all of the bloodline. Are they all circumcised? Yes, they are circumcised. Are they following those 613 commands? Yeah, I mean, as, as well as they can, yeah. Um, all right. And then they start adding stuff to this. What's the first thing they start adding? What do Jesus and his disciples also do now? Baptism, yes, good, okay. So they sort of add this fourth. Baptism by water. Okay, that becomes John the Baptist. So, so the disciples are actually out baptizing, right? Um, and Jesus is baptized, right? Uh, and then eventually, when Jesus dies and rises, what's the next thing that gets added onto this? Okay, it's the, well, baptism by water, that leads, and then Jesus says, well, wait, wait, and you'll receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, so 
through the Gospels and, and through the book of Acts, through the first part of the book of Acts, this is sort of what defines original Christianity. Um, this is a, it, it's, it's very much Jewish with a couple things added. Um, it, again, they see it as, as, as a continuum, as part of it. They don't see it as something new, something special, something different. This is, this is what Christianity is in the earliest iterations. Okay. All right. So then you've got Paul who goes out and starts preaching, and he starts going to these synagogues. And some of the Jews, some of the Jews accept it, but a lot of the Jews don't. But Paul starts attracting these Gentiles. And, all these, and these Gentiles are like, hey, can we join? What do you think? Um, Paul's like, I don't, you know, what do we do? What do we do with this? Um, and to be honest with you, the, the biggest hang-up, it, it's, so it's not so much this stuff. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's the second one. It's like, you know, I mean, these are adult males. That's going to be an obstacle to conversion if we're going to make them get circumcised because they wouldn't have been circumcised. So this becomes, yeah, this becomes a big issue. Um, uh, the bloodline you know, is sort of an issue. You would think it would be an issue, but even prior to Jesus, you could have converts to Judaism. So, you know, if they were willing to convert to Judaism, the Jews would be like, okay, well, you weren't in the bloodline, but we, you know, we, we can make a place for you if you're willing to do all these other things, right? Um, but this is, yeah, this is... This this is this is the hang up. Um, so for new Christians, so this is the first iteration. But for new Christians, uh, Gentile Christians, what do you do with these people? How you know do you, do they have to do all this? And that, I mean, it really, that, that forced the question. I mean, it, it was really a crisis in the early church. Let me reread this. If a male is uncircumcised, that is, if the flesh of his foreskin has not been cut away, such a one shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that really defines, you know, the covenant relationship. So this, I mean, this was a this was a tough, tough question. Um, all right. So how does it get solved? <laughs> how does it get solved? How is it that Paul wins the day on this? Okay. 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 So, yeah, the way the way the book the book of Acts is written, uh, according to Luke, Peter Peter has this dream, and yeah, he sees it. It's a pretty famous famous scene. He sees this white sheet come down from heaven, and there's all these animals on it, and he hears this voice, "Take and eat," and he's like, "Wait a minute, some of this isn't kosher." I can't eat this, and, and and the voice is like, well, what God has made is, you know, is, is it's okay, um, and again, sort of applying it to to the Gentile, like, like it's okay now, right? Um, so that's, I mean, that's that's sort of one aspect of it. That's Luke's version of it, uh, and 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 talking about uh, Peter's dream. So that's sort of sort of softening the ground a little bit for some of these decisions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you want to unpack that a little bit? Yeah. 
Okay. And that, that parable can be applied to the Jews and the Gentiles, but there's other ways to apply that parable too, right? Right. Uh, it could be the, the religious or the non-religious. It could, be the, it could be the wealthy or the poor, right? Because they go out into the streets and they drag these people out. Um, so, but I mean, yes, that is one way, that is one way to interpret the parallel or the parable. Uh, but Jesus isn't... He never comes out and says, well, I'm talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, right? I mean, he never, he never says that. Um, okay, well, the sinners that he comes for are the, the Jewish, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, right? Uh, but they're still Jewish, right? So how are they able to? Uh, what was the what was the turning point here? Well, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. Were the first converts what? Uh, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It comes back to here, yeah. So, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 like the it's the sign of the covenant. It's it, again, it's like being branded. It's like being branded on the on the most intimate part of your flesh. Like this is something that. Well, it, it's sort of like it's sort of like something like like if you're really committed to someone, you're really dedicated. You're willing to get that tattoo on your arm, right? I mean, you're you're willing to brand yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, branding and branding on the most intimate part of, of the flesh. I get that. I mean, that's the best explanation I can I can give you. Um, why didn't he choose something else? Why didn't he choose tattoos? Why didn't he choose a, a mohawk or whatever? I, yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Well. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um but what becomes the what becomes the turning point in this argument? If you read the book of Acts as and here it is. If you read the book of Acts as Paul is going out and he's preaching to these people, um they're coming to believe, all right? These Gentile people are coming to believe. And guess what happens to them? They get the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit comes upon these Gentiles. They haven't fulfilled any of these things. And all of a sudden, the, Paul's preaching to them, he's praying over them, and boom, the Holy Spirit is upon They haven't even been baptized yet. All right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden... They're starting at step five, right? They skip everything else, right? And Paul, to his credit, says, look, God must be accepting of them if he's willing to give them the Holy Spirit. They, had, they didn't have to do anything else for it. So if God's accepted them, 
who are we to say no, right? Who, we, who are we to put all these burdens on them, to jump through all these hoops when God has already indicated that he's accepting of them through the Holy Spirit? And he sees this as a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy in Joel. I will pour out my Holy Spirit upon all the nations, right? That this is what's happening. And it's funny. So when they get baptized, or when they, when they receive the Holy Spirit, then Paul's like, well, I guess we should baptize them. So, <laughs> so then, they, then, they, then they become baptized. Um, but for them, sorry. So for them, this is what happens first. And then they say, okay, well, we know baptism is important for Christianity. This is, this is part of it. So, so then, they, then they receive the uh, baptism of water. And that's the argument that he makes. Look, if God has already accepted these folks, who are we to put all these burdens on top of them? Um, And then he's got to make the case, well, okay, so why aren't we putting these? I mean, aren't these things important? They are important. Um, But then that gets into his theology. Now, Now he's got to make the case that this stuff isn't as important as it appears to be. Um, and he starts doing that. If you've read Romans, I mean, he, he does that, and he does that in, in some of his other letters. He, he starts going through the, the theological gymnastics of, of figuring out how does this work theologically? How does this, how does this justification come from? Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, this, you know, his, his, his role in, um, in advocating for, for the Gentiles um, and we can get into this a little bit, but but again, this this uh, can get <laughs> this can get can get deep pretty quickly with with some of his theological justifications. Um, uh, so we'll take the the first one, bloodline. So yeah, obviously these are not these are not children of Abraham, but he's like, well, wait a minute, they sort of are children of Abraham in what respect? Not through, no, not through Ishmael. Okay. He, he does some interesting, uh, interesting theological gymnastics with some of this. He goes back to the Abraham story and he says, look, Abraham had two sons. One was the son of the flesh, Hagar's son, right? He slept with Hagar and he had this kid. The other was the, spirit, was, was the son of the promise. That was this promise that was made. This this miraculous kid that came from Sarah who was, who was barren, right? So, so Abraham has two children. He has children of the flesh. And he has children of the promise. Now he's applying, it's interesting, the gymnastics he's doing. He's applying that now to the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews are now the children of the flesh, right? They're the ones that can trace their fleshly bloodline to Abraham. The Gentiles are now the children of the promise. These are the ones that God anticipated would eventually come to him. Um, And how are they coming to him? Well, they're coming to him through faith. They're children, so there's, there's the children that follow the flesh, and there's the, there's the flesh and the spirit. There's, there's the faith um, piece. Um, and, and this is the gymnastics that he, that he does, and, and it's interesting. Um, let, me, let me pull this out. Uh, th- this is a big passage here in Genesis 15, 6. Um, So this is just before God makes his covenant with Abraham. And, and I, I think we read this last time. Um, uh, God, God appears to Abraham. He says, fear not, Abraham. I, I, I'm your shield. I'll make you very great. And Abraham says, well, what good might will your gifts be if I keep on being childless? And uh, see, you haven't, get, you, you haven't given me any offspring, so one of my servants is going to be my heir. And then God says, no, 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 that one won't be your heir. Uh, your, own, your own progeny will be your heir. Um, uh, he says he takes him outside. Look at look at the stars of the sky. That's that's how that's how many offspring you're going to have. Uh, they're going to be that numerous. 
so shall uh, count the stars if you can, just so he says, shall your descendants be. And then in verse 6, Abram put his faith in the Lord who credited it to him as an act of righteousness. Okay, so Abraham believed God. He put his faith in God. And God, was, and God somehow is like, all right, that's an act of righteousness. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I want. Okay. Um, so Paul runs with that. Like, God is pleased by Abraham's faith. Notice, this is before Abraham is circumcised. This is before the law appears. God is, or Abraham is sort of justified by his faith in God's eyes. He's on good terms with God because of his faith. And Paul's saying, look, that's what these Gentiles are doing. Because of their faith, they're on good terms with God. It's their faith that's justifying them. Before circumcision, before following these 613 commands, just like Abraham. So these are the true children of Abraham, says Paul. Now, that would have been extremely offensive to a Jewish audience. And you can see why Paul gets in trouble with the Jews. Yeah would have been extremely offensive to a Jewish audience. Um, but that's what, that's what Paul is arguing. So he's saying, you know, if you want to talk about true descendants, you know, again, Abraham had two kids. One was a, a child of the flesh, and one was a child of the promise, right? Again, Paul is saying the Jews were the, were the product of the flesh. The Gentiles are now the, the product of this, of this promise. And they're getting there by faith. Because they have faith, they're acting like Abraham. Abraham had faith. God considered him righteous because of his faith. God is now considering the Gentiles righteous because of their faith. What's that? Oh, in the original story, they are the promise. Yes, he flips it. He flips it theologically. Yeah, that would have been very offensive to a Jewish audience. Because they're like, what are you talking about? We are the children of the promise. We're the descendants of Isaac, right? Yeah. So you can see why the Jews didn't like him. I mean, I, he, he got into a lot of trouble with, with, with the, the Jewish leaders because of his, yeah, because of his rhetoric. Um, but he's making an argument for the inclusion of the Gentiles. He's, and he's making a pretty strong argument. Um, uh, and then, you know, circumcision. So he, he kind of he runs with that a little bit. So the children of the flesh, um, you know, they're still following the flesh, right? With circumcision, by this insistence on circumcision. But this new group is, is these, are, these are the children of the Spirit, the children of the promise. And so we don't need to, we don't need to go back to the flesh, right? Um, that faith, faith checks that box, right? Um, faith justifies here. When he talks about works of the flesh, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about these 613 commandments. And he's talking about, he's also talking about circumcision. And he's talking about this, this wrestling between the flesh and the spirit. Um, and that's, that's really what he's, what he's getting at. And he's arguing, you know, if we're ending in the spirit, why go back to the flesh? Right? If God's already given the Spirit to these folks, why go back to the flesh? Why, why burden them with all this stuff? But then that raises... The, yeah, go ahead. Why did they come up with the compromise? The circumcision is what carries out, but yeah, that's a good point. I, and, and I think we touched on that last class. But the compromise, so there are, when they, when they have the Jerusalem Council, there are four, four things that they obligate the Gentiles to do out of 613, right? There's four. And they're not even, 
like what you would think would be the most important, like thou shall not kill, right? Or thou, you know, they don't even do that, right? Uh, or circum, I mean, one could argue circumcision would be one of the one of the most important ones. Um, oops, sorry. Um, uh, those four, as it turns out, those are obligations of Jews that they're supposed to obligate any Gentiles in their midst to also follow. So there are certain laws that Jews have to obligate Gentiles to follow so that Jews can practice their Judaism. Okay, um, And so this will, so by obligating the Gentiles to follow those laws, this will clear the, clear the road for um, fellowship between the Jews and the Gentiles so that the Jews can actually coexist with these Gentile Christians. So the Jewish Christians can coexist with these Gentile Christians. Because the Jewish Christians don't want to give up their Judaism. They still want to be in accordance with the law. Um, and for them to be in accordance with the law, they have to obligate the Gentiles in their midst to follow these four laws. So it's not about, it's not about the Gentiles so much as it's about the Jewish Christians continuing to be Jewish Christians. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're in there. They're in the book of Acts. Um, yeah, it's really, uh, yeah. Uh, don't, don't, don't consume blood. No meat uh, offered to idols. Um, uh, strangled animals. Yeah, that might, uh, I can find it here. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, what was the? Here it is. It's, so it's in the book of Acts, uh, chapter fifteen is the council. Um, uh, let's see where the laws are. Uh, well, I can read this. So this is where. Um, Actually, and this is in, actually in Peter's mouth as, as it appears in Acts. Uh, my brothers, you are well aware that from the early days God made his choice among you that, that through my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Uh, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness by granting them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for by faith he purified their hearts. Why then are you now putting God to the test by placing on the shoulders of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? And that's something that Paul will argue. We've got the 613 commands, but none of us follows all of them anyway, right? None of us is perfect in, in doing this. So this, is, this becomes a, a burden for us. Um, on the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way as they um, the whole assembly fell silent as they listened to Paul and Barnabas describe the signs and works uh, that God had worked among the Gentiles through them. Um, and then James uh, says, okay, in verse 19, is my judgment, therefore, that we ought, we ought to stop troubling the Gentiles who turn to God, but tell them by letter to avoid pollution from idols, unlawful marriage, the meat of strangled animals, and blood. Um, for Moses, for generations now, has had, those, uh, has had those who proclaim him in every town as he has been read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Um, so he's talking about these, yeah, these folks that are attracted to, to the Old Testament, um, to this notion of, of one God. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, those are the four that they, that they decide on. Um, so yeah, so... Um, so the Gentiles are very happy to hear <laughs> that they don't have to get circumcised. That's good news for them. Uh, and that really opens up uh, the church to, to Paul's missionary activity and allows him to recruit these Gentiles um, in droves, uh, you know, um, because they don't, they don't have this, this obstacle to overcome anymore. Um, and it's interesting, if you get into Paul's theology, one could ask then, all right, well, if this wasn't necessary, why did God do it in the first place? Like, why did God give them the law if they just really needed faith? Right? It's a good question. And Paul says, it's not that the law is bad. The law, what the law does is the law defines sin for us. It helps us to define what is sin and what isn't sin. Um, but Paul says, you know, once we have sin defined, 
then sin uses that opportunity. It's kind of like my son, you know, and, and uh, you know, any of you with, with young kids can relate to this. If you tell them, you know, uh, don't touch the Christmas tree, right? What's the next thing they're going to do? They're going to go touch the Christmas tree, right? You've defined what you don't want them to do. But now, like, temptation works, and it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe I'll go touch the Christmas tree now, right? And he says that's what, that's what happens. Um, and Paul makes the argument that if you put this burden on them, if you put 613, like, they're going to have to follow all of these. And anyone who breaks one has broken it all. And once you break the law, you're not justified anymore. And that, that now you're under, under the punishment of the law. So, you know, we're, we've all fallen short. We've all failed in this respect. We're not, we're not justified. We're, we're um, you know, we're, we're, we're all sinners in that respect. Um, so what's the solution? What's the solution if we're, if we're all sinners? And again, this, this gets into Paul's thinking, Paul's theology, but his solution is this. Um, when we get baptized with water, that's sort of us dying. Um, and think of, think of baptism almost like, like a drowning, like you're going underwater and you're drowning. And then when you come up, it's like a new life. When we are baptized, we die with Christ. Is what is what Paul says. We're baptized into his his death, just as he died and he rose. And again, it's a clever argument. Um, think about well, think about the law right now. How many laws do we have to follow and obey? What's the biggest law that people don't like to do in April every year? Pay taxes, right? How many of you would like to not pay taxes? How many of you would like to not be under that law anymore? Okay, how are you ever going to get out of that law? Nothing is certain, right? You guys know this, this saying. Nothing is certain but what? Death and taxes, right? Right? But what if you did die and came back? Would you have to pay taxes anymore? Not if you're dead. Right? Right? And that's kind of where Paul's going with this theology. Like when Jesus died, he died and now he rose, he's no longer under the law. Because he died, right? And so through our baptism, when we die with him, we, we are dead to the law as well. We rise with him. And so the law is no longer applicable to us. It's a clever argument. Um, it's, it's, it's a clever argument. Um, but in the same way, we, we die with him. We, we are raised with him. Uh, and, and that's why we are no longer under, under the law in the way that, that they were. Uh, it's, it's through that, through that participation of, of water baptism, uh, death and rebirth. Um, so again, it's, again, the, 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 these, these are kind of complicated arguments, but that's, that's what Paul, that's what Paul does with it. Um, okay. Any, any questions about this? Again, I could spend a whole semester on this, but, but we're just kind of, kind of dappling here a little bit. Okay, so Paul's the ideal witness. That's one facet of him we, we talked about. Number two, he's the advocate for the Gentiles, right? We just talked about that. Um, uh, number three, uh, it's funny, sometimes we don't even think about this, but um, Paul wrote, or is at least attributed to have written, the majority of the New Testament, right? There's 27 books of the New Testament, and at least 13 of those at least 13 of those are attributed to Paul. So it's kind of weird to think about that the person that wrote the majority of the New Testament, as far as we know, never met Jesus in his ministerial life, only encountered the risen Jesus. Uh, which is, is that kind of odd to think about? It's kind of odd to think about. Um, but yeah, writes, writes the majority of, of the New Testament. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so as, I mean, as, as you know, as Paul goes out on these missionary journeys, um, he establishes these little, these little Christian communities, uh, groups of believers who meet together and reach out to him for advice. And, and he, 
he will revisit them and, and he will he will write letters to them and they value those letters and they reread them and they keep them and they cherish them and uh, and they end up getting incorporated into our into our New Testament. Um, so again, uh, Hebrews is, is I don't know that I'd really throw Hebrews in there, but but the other thirteen are attributed uh, attributed to Paul. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too scholarly on this, but most biblical scholars would say, well, there's at least seven that we would really we can really say are the authentic letters of Paul. Um, the others are are attributed to Paul, but may or may not have been written directly by Paul. Um, uh, but yeah, so so there there thirteen are attributed to him. At least seven are are as far as scholars concerned, um, you know, come from his hand or, or his dictation. Um, again, to various various communities addressing various problems that those communities had. Uh, again, a lot of this having to do with um, uh, the Jewish Gentile relationship, um, or sometimes just practical advice on on living and, and what it, what it means to be a Christian in the first century um, with with these with these communities. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Author of the majority. Of the New Testament. And again, I feel like sort of, um, and again, not to, not to be negative on it, but I feel like in, in Catholic circles, we have the first reading, which is from the Old Testament. We have the gospel reading, which is from the gospels. And usually those two are connected. And then we have the second reading, something from Paul, and it's not always connected. And, it's, and, and because we don't have a lot of context to it, and it's a letter, you know, there's a lot of historical context that we... I, we kind of again we kind of miss out on what's going on in in some of those letters, um, and usually they're you know they're letters of encouragement or, or whatever. But um, but I feel like it it sort of gets kind of shortchanged uh, even in the liturgical cycle uh, because they they usually make an effort to connect the first reading and the gospel reading, um, but not that that second reading isn't always isn't always connected. Um, so yeah, um, again. Author of the majority of the New Testament, uh, and again, just kind of odd to think that the person that wrote the majority of the New Testament never, as far as we know, knew Jesus during his ministerial years. Um, yeah, uh, but again, there's a lot of Christian theology that, that takes place in those letters, and we could unpack that. You know, I could spend a semester unpacking that. But um, but let me pause there. Any questions on that that point? So you, you can see the providence of God in the present in Paul. With everything how without Paul, we couldn't even get that news to us here. Yeah. It was because of Paul, not what we could use up to our level up to today. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was like in our time, it's like Saint John Paul II, the Saint John Paul II, who was traveling a lot, you know. Uh, Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, through my travels and, and, and through my research uh, into, into Paul, uh, I came to the conclusion, you know, Peter was the rock. Peter may have been the one that Jesus built his church on, but Paul's the one that filled it. Paul's the one that filled it. And we are products of this church. We are products of the Gentile church. Um, the Jewish church disappeared pretty quickly in history. Um, it, it was really the Gentile church that, that survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are definitely products of that. And again, that was something that, that we talked about last time when I was here, the, the fact that, you know, we can eat lobster and not think twice about it, right? Um, yeah, and, and that's, you know, that's the, you know the, these, these laws are just so foreign to us today, and yet really would have been an instrumental component of the early church. Um, but again, that's 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 the direction that it went. Um, again, in large part due to due, due to Paul. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Father Shane. Uh, the you mentioned just the um, kind of the the way that Acts attributes to Peter may be what scholars uh, are not are sometimes 
wonder about um, because within the depiction of Acts, there's it, it seems like the, the Acts recounts a genuine movement of Peter toward the Gentile position. Yes. Are scholars suspicious of that actually being the case? Um, because of uh, the letters of Paul? Yes. And maybe well, there's some question about that based on the letters of Paul. Um, and then the question, because Luke, in writing Acts, I mean, he's an associate of Paul, so is the idea then of the scholars that Luke would have tried to validate the Pauline mission to the Gentiles by putting some of the by by attributing to Peter or kind of having Peter legitimize that movement in a way that is not necessarily like, like I mean are they because I think this is for me at least yeah that, I mean that seems I don't know scholars are you know, scholars always have their theories and they come from right dissertations but part of my question sometimes is I mean, is that really, is there really evidence for that, or is this, like, what? It's even bigger, it goes even deeper than that. To me, that's a pretty significant charge to say that, well, Peter didn't really think that the Gentiles, like, you know, they just put those things on Peter's lips because they wanted to legitimize them. Ooh, that's, that's, you better have some darn good evidence if you're going to make that kind of an accusation. Well, that's coming from that's coming from Paul himself, who's who's berating Peter for not not being better to the Gentiles than yeah. I mean, that's in that's in uh, that's in Galatians, I believe. But that still wouldn't undermine the Council of Jerusalem. Oh no, 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 no. Or the account of Peter's experience in the you know the vision and other pieces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting if you think about this. So Paul's influence. I mean, we're. I, I hesitate to use this word, but like deep state, right? Paul, Paul kind of becomes the, the deep state here. This is what I mean by that. Um, <laughs> okay, so Jesus dies around 30 AD. Remember, Paul is active. Paul's ministry precedes the Gospels, right? So he's writing, he's acting, um, you know, between 40 and 50, well, between 40 and 60. Well, really 50 to 60, let's say. Um, 50 to 60. So this is Paul's ministry. Okay. Um, so Jesus dies here in 30. Paul's active between 50 and 60. And then as far as we know, as far as biblical scholars are, are concerned, the first gospel isn't written until 70, right? That's Mark. And then, uh, and then Matthew and Luke come in in, in eighty, as far as as far as conventional biblical scholarship is concerned. And then John comes in at ninety. Um, but eighty, Luke, Luke writes so that Luke Luke acts right. So the Gospels are written after, and again we. Sometimes don't remember that. They're written after Paul's ministry. Okay. Yeah, after these letters. Yeah, his, after the missionary journeys, after the letters, right? Paul's ministry and letters. So that when you get into the Gospels, you see this tension sort of at play as the gospel writers write about Jesus' ministry. And you see some contradictions in, in how they're presenting Jesus' ministry. So, for instance, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' public ministry is entirely devoted to the Jews. When he sends his disciples out, he says, "Don't you know? I've only come to the, for the lost sheep of, of the house of Israel. Don't go into the Gentiles. Go to the go to the Jews." His whole ministry is about is focused on on being there for the Jews. 
it's only at the very, very end of Jesus's, after Jesus dies and rises, literally the last couple of verses in the Gospel of Matthew, then Jesus says, okay, go out to all nations, teach them what I've taught you, and baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' ministry is all about the Jews, and then it's at the very last, last little piece of the Gospel, then he sends his disciples out to the Gentiles. But it's definitely a sequential thing. It's, it's Jesus going to the Jews first, and then the Gentiles very, very at the end. It's interesting, though, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus' public ministry, he'll do something, uh, it, it, he goes back and forth across the Sea of Galilee. He, he, starts on the, he starts on the west side, and then he goes to the east side. Then he goes to the west side, then he goes to the east side. The west side was the Jewish side. And that's where he starts, and he does some things on the Jewish side, but then he goes across these, he goes to the Gentile side, and then he does kind of the same things. So he starts with an exorcism on, on the west side, and then he goes to the east, and he, and, he's, and he does an exorcism. And then he comes back to the west, and he's met with requests for healing. And he multiplies bread, and he feeds crowds of thousands. That's the Jewish side. Then he goes back to the eastern side, to the Gentile side. He's met with requests for healings. He multiplies bread. He, he feeds thousands. He's doing a parallel ministry between the Jews and the Gentiles, between the Jews and the Gentiles. So it's interesting how those early evangelists are understanding Jesus now comes back to this question of where do the Gentiles fit in and what, what, how would Jesus approach them? In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is all about the Jews and then the Gentiles are at the very end. In Mark's Gospel, no, it's, they're on, on, on the same footing. Jesus is going back and forth to both to both groups. Um, so in Luke's gospel, so Luke is associated with Peter, was a traveling companion of Peter. Jesus, Jesus ministers to everybody all at once. They all have equal opportunity to him. They all have equal access to him, the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, so it's interesting how, how this question really uh, influences and what Paul does kind of then influences later how the Jews are, or, or how the Christians are, are portraying Jesus's ministry um, when it comes to the Jewish Gentile question. Uh, yeah, it's weird to think about. It, it's it's, uh, but I mean these are the these are the dynamics at play. Um, so uh, for uh, one one more aspect, I, how are we doing on time? Okay. Um, so again, uh, what does Paul really bring to the table? Number one, he's the ideal witness to Jesus' resurrection. Number two, he's the advocate for the Gentiles. He, he opens that door of Christianity to them in a way that it wouldn't have been opened otherwise. Number three, he's the author of the majority of the New Testament. Okay? He, he ends up writing most of it and ends up influencing... What he didn't write uh, in terms of how the Christians think about think back then about Jesus and Jesus' ministry. Um, and then number four uh, has to do with how he's portrayed in Luke, how he's portrayed in, in, the, in the book of Acts. Um, okay, now, be honest, and it's okay if you didn't. How many of you read the book of Acts in preparation for tonight? It's a long book. It's, it's, there's a lot there. I'd be impressed if, if you did. I mean, given the, given the time of year that we're in um, and all, all the busyness that's going around. Um, but, and, and I never really caught this again until I did more studies on, on Paul. But the way Luke sets up the book of Acts, it's, it's brilliant. The first half of it, and it's almost divided equally in half, the first half of it focuses on Peter. And Peter's ministry, and what Peter does, again, his ministry is primarily to the Jews. And then halfway through the book, Peter disappears, and it focuses on Paul, and Paul's ministry with the Gentiles. But the way that Peter, or the way that Luke sets this up, and again, we sort of have... Peter's primacy here. He was recognized as one of the one of the well, he's recognized as the head of the early church. So they know he's legit, right? 
But all the things that he does, all the things that he encounters, all the things that he experiences, then get paralleled in Paul's ministry. He experiences some of the same things. There's, there's, I mean, it's, it's amazing how many parallels there are between Peter and Paul. And that's very deliberate in, in, um, in Luke's writing. Uh, because he's setting them as sort of as equals. Here's, here's the apostle to the Jews. Here's the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, and in church tradition in, in Rome, their feast day is shared. It's the feast day of Peter and Paul. They were considered equivalent um, in their importance. Uh, so what, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, let me give you some examples. Um, so Peter's ministry kind of begins when he has an encounter with the risen Jesus uh, on Mount Olivet, 40 days after the, after the resurrection, uh, and Jesus commissions him to be his witness. Uh, Paul uh, also has an encounter with the risen Jesus, and Jesus commissions him to be his witness. Um, both participate in a Pentecost-type experience. Okay, um, With Peter, it was in the upper room. There's 12 men there. The Holy Spirit descends. They speak in tongues. They prophesy. This is in the upper room in Jerusalem. This is in chapters 1 and 2. In Paul's case, there are 12 men involved. The Holy Spirit descends. They speak in tongues. They prophesy. This happens in Ephesus. Okay, So what happens with Peter? Happens with Paul. Peter's first miracle in, in chapter 3 of Acts, um, he's outside the Jerusalem temple, and he sees this crippled beg- beggar who's, who's, who's asking for his help. And Peter, Peter, as Luke describes it, looked intently. He looks intently at this beggar and, uh, and then cures him. Um, Paul has a very similar experience. that he, he experiences this crippled man near the temple of Zeus, right? At this Gentile house of worship. So Peter's encountering this experience at the, at the Jewish house of worship, and then, and then Paul has this at the, at the Gentile house of worship. He looks intently at the crippled man and then heals him. Um, uh, they both deliver major speeches, um, uh, uh, Peter does it in in uh, in the Jerusalem temple. Paul does it at the at the Areopagus in in Athens. Um, uh, both speak before the Sanhedrin. Uh, both speak uh, to the Jerusalem Jews, who they call the the circumcisers. Um, the last speech, uh, Peter's last speech recorded is in Jerusalem, where he is affirming the Gentiles. He's affirming that that group should be able to, to come in. Um, Paul's last speech is in Rome. Again, he's affirming the Gentiles, their inclusion as well. Um, both men are arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. Uh, in Peter, it's, it's chapters 4 and 5. In Paul, it's chapters 23. Um, uh, both of them use uh, kind of these these really um, unique ways of healing. Um, so in in Peter in Peter's case, if you may recall, he walks by and as his shadow touches people as he walks by, they're cured. Um, so it's sort of like an indirect cure. Um, Paul has the same thing. There, there's face cloths and aprons that are, that are touched to Paul, and then and then people will use those and touch them to other people, and and those will heal. So kind of this, this indirect mediated healing takes place. Um, uh, both are imprisoned and have miraculous escapes. Uh, both are put under very excessively heavy guards. Um, according to, and again, we can question the accuracy of this. It, it sounds extreme. Uh, in Peter's case, there were four squads of four soldiers each that were guarding him. Four squads of four soldiers to guard one guy. Right, and in Paul's case, he, he there was a dust up in Jerusalem, and and they were going to try to kill him, and then so they had to take him up to to Antioch. Um, according to Acts, two hundred soldiers, seventy horsemen, and two hundred auxiliaries were there, were assigned just to protect Paul. Um, I don't know. I mean that that's that's the information that Luke gives us. Uh, that, that that's it. Um, uh, in both cases, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is conferred upon those who are previously baptized. 
Um, uh, in Peter's case, uh, it's following Philip's work in Samaria in, in, in chapter 8. In Paul's case, it's following Apollos' work in Ephesus in chapter 19. Um, both men curse those who oppose the work of the Holy Spirit. This is a famous one. And uh, Peter curses Ananias and Sapphira, and, the, and they die. Um, Paul curses uh, Elimus, the, the magician, and, and, he, and he, he's blinded. Um, uh, both reside with skilled workers. Um, both have visions involving Gentiles. Both are mistaken for or worshipped as a god. Okay, um, uh, Peter, uh, in, following the Cornelius incident, uh, they, they go to worship Peter. They, they think he's something special. He's like, no, no, no. Um, uh, and then and in Paul's case, they think he's Hermes uh, by the Philippians. Um, so yeah, they're both mistaken or worshipped uh, as a god. Um, both face the circumcised of Jerusalem and, uh, and, and have to defend themselves. Um, both are arrested at the time of a major Jewish holiday. Um, uh, both attend the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, when Peter is last seen in the book of Acts, he's affirming God's acceptance of the Gentiles. When Paul is last seen in Acts, he's affirming uh, God's acceptance of the Gentiles. Both are martyred, eventually martyred in Rome under Nero. Um, Peter is crucified upside down, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, because Paul is a because Paul has a Roman citizenship, they could not crucify him. Um, so he got, he got a more dignified execution. He was, he was beheaded. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that's how he, he ended. Um, and today, both have major um, churches in Rome dedicated to them. Obviously, St. Peter's Basilica is in, is in Vatican City. Uh, St. Paul's outside the wall is is in Rome. That's uh, that's a really cool um, cool church that that I've been um, that that's there. So it, it's these 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 parallels between between Peter and Paul. So at least as as Luke is writing, as the Book of Acts presents them, they're on par with each other. Uh, they're they're equals. Uh, again, Peter is important as far as um, spreading Christianity to the Jews. Paul is important as far as spreading Christianity to Gentiles. But again, as history will, will unfold, it's the Gentile church that grows exponentially and the Jewish church disappears. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I think those are, those are the four things that I would uh, kind of summarize, emphasize as far as what Paul brings to the table. He's the ideal witness to Jesus' resurrection, advocate for the author of the majority of the New Testament, and uh, at least as, as Luke presents him, he's on par with Peter uh, as far as their ministry, as far as their outreach. They're just going to different, going to different groups, um, one to the Jews, one to the Gentiles. Okay, so did I convince you? Would you did, did Paul make the top, I don't know, top two, top three of, of importance in, in, uh, in, you know, in the history of Christianity? All right. Uh, any any questions, comments, clarifications? What are the five? What's well, number five? No, the five uh, questions. So we know this Paul, Peter, and the first question. Asked. Oh, who would be the top five? Yeah, what I'm asking is, would he make would would he now make the top three in your list? If if if, if he wasn't in the top three, uh, does he does he now did did he get did he get that high? Uh, what are my top five? I don't know that I can answer that. <laughs> I don't know that I can answer that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, that, that's that's a that's a tough one. It, it's hard. I mean, there's obviously there's so many aspects to that to that question. Um, you know, as a Catholic, it's hard to dismiss the importance of Peter. It's hard to dismiss the, the importance of, of of Mary, right? As a Catholic. Um, but then, as a biblical scholar, it's hard to dismiss the importance of any of the evangelists, or, or of uh, obviously of, of Paul um, and what he brings to the table. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's it is it is it's a it's a it's a good it's a good question. Um, all right, other other thoughts, other comments, questions.
criticisms. Are we included because we baptize and we believe so that we became Christian or how? Just a silly question. No, wait, ask it again. Are we, uh, so Paul was uh, preaching for the Gentiles, we said. Yes, and then we are he's blood. advocating for the Gentiles. Yes, and we don't, we don't have blood blood. Blood line with the Imam, but we are Christian. Right. So because we baptized and believed, that's why we included. Yeah. Again, Paul would make the argument that we we are the true heirs. We are the true heirs of Abraham because we're not heirs according to the flesh. We're not heirs according to the bloodline, but we're heirs according to the promise. We're heirs according to the Spirit. We're heirs because of our faith. In the same way that Abraham had faith in God before he was circumcised and before the law came into play, God already saw him as righteous, attributed righteousness to him because of his faith. And so Paul would argue that's what's key. That's what's key. And so that's what really defines the true heirs. And it's funny. So in the Gospels, right, Again, this plays into the Gospels where, where Jesus is with his followers and somebody comes up to him and says, hey, your mother and brother outside, they want to see you. And he says, well, who are my brother and brother? They're the ones that do my will, do, do what I teach. Those are my true mother and brothers and, and disciples, right? That's, that's talking about the same thing. Bloodline doesn't matter anymore, right? It's faith. So it's funny how, again, Paul's theology predates the Gospels and may influence you know, how all those Gospels are, are perceiving Jesus and Jesus' ministry and Jesus' words. Um, yeah. So the Ten Commandments are included to 613? Yes, the Ten are part of the 613. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, in... in I, I should clarify this. Um, in Paul's rhetoric, he talks about it's faith that saves you, not works of the law. Okay, It's faith, not works. Now, unfortunately, when a lot of us hear that today, we misinterpret that. What Paul's talking about is works of the law. He's, and he's talking about primarily circumcision and following the 613 commands. Um, and he's saying, you know, it's not, not circumcision that saves you, it, it's your faith. There's an epistle in James's, James's epistle, which is also in the New Testament. James kind of takes issue with that and he's, because some of the Christians are like, oh, well, then it doesn't matter what I do. And James is like, no, 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 that's not, that's not what we're talking about. Like, you still got to do good things, right? Uh, it's, not just, it's not just saying you believe in Jesus. Like, you got to live that out, right? Uh, and that's, you know, that's what's important. Anybody can say they believe it's it's how you put that into practice. That's that's important. So um, so it appears like like James is kind of like okay, don't understand Paul in its context, right? Understand what he's talking about. He's talking about works of the law. He's not necessarily talking about just good works in general. Um, we're still we're still called to, to do good things, right? We're still called we're still called to love and put that into practice, right? Um, so James is like, well, don't don't take that off the table, right? It's it's you know it's it's the it's the Torah prescriptions that he's, he's talking about. So, good, so good, good question. Any other questions? You want to? Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty close. Yeah. Um, there's a, as you say, there's a lot to cover. And what, um, maybe just a sense real quick with, are there things that you think are especially important to us with regard to understanding the letters um, of St. Paul as kind of as a genre of scripture? Um, I know that that opens up a whole can of worms, but maybe um, uh, especially some things that we may not because when we think about a letter, it's obviously a pretty different thing from what a letter was in, the, in that time. But are there things you think would be helpful 
as far as kind of how we read those letters of St. Paul. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole rhetorical style that he uses. There's there's rhetorical strategies that he uses. There's there's keywords and hook words, and I mean, there's all this, and you can get. I mean, there's a whole it's a whole study um, as as far as this goes. But as far as understanding the the content of it, I think this background, the, the Jewish Christian divide or the the Jewish Gentile divide is key. If, if you can keep that in mind as far as the background, that's going to illuminate a lot of what Paul is talking about in most of his letters, because that's really what occupies a lot of his, a lot of his, um, his attention. Uh, and again, I, for us as modern Christians, it's like, well, okay, so, so that argument's settled. That was settled a long time ago. So are the, this, isn't, this isn't intention for us anymore. So is this important? And that gets to the practical applicability of this. Um, as we wrestle with in groups and out groups, whether it be in our church, in our community, in our, in our lives, in our social dealings, um, you know, this early Christian community really struggled with, um, with including these Gentiles. And they really wrestled with it. And it, was, it wasn't an easy thing for them to, to get through. Um, I should mention, I, I uh, you know, I, on this point, I mentioned in Mark's gospel when Jesus is going back and forth to the, the sea, he's going from the Jewish side to the Gentile side to the Jewish side to the Gentile side. On those crossings, every time they go from the Jewish to the Gentile side, there's storms, there's stormy seas. It's difficult for them to get over there. Uh, smooth sailing back to the Jewish side but stormy weather when it goes to the Gentile side, right? So, you know, as people, we, we have our, you know, we're, we have this, we have, a, we have a tribal mentality sometimes. You know, these are our people. This is our tribe. This is our, this is, here's, here's our comfort zone, right? We still struggle with that today. How do we include the other? How do we include that, those that are different, from us, and, and what you know, what are the guidelines that need to be put in place, and, and what are how, how do we proceed with that? It's not always easy. It can be rocky, um, and so I think some of the some of the struggles of the early church can be informative for us as we try to navigate some of those same issues in our church and outside of our church. You know, even even today, um, that's kind of the practical <laughs> application side side of some of this. Um, any other questions? So when uh, Peter, you said something about uh, eating about the, the things that wasn't... Eating the non-kosher, yeah, 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 yeah. So what does that mean then? So as... It, so as the book of Acts presents it, um, that's, that's kind of God telling Peter that, hey, it's okay to include these Gentiles. It's, it's, it's okay to include them. Like, I created them, they're okay. Um, they're all right. Uh, he's referring to, his, he's talking about Gentiles, not mm -hmm. about the food. Well, that's the symbol. The symbol is all of a sudden, all of a sudden these things that Peter thought wasn't okay to eat, now all of a sudden, according to this, this, this vision, now, now things have changed, and now it's okay. And God's like, well, what I've created is, you know, it's okay. Um, and so that's, again, sort of softening the ground for Peter to come to the idea that, okay, we can expand this. We can open this, this, this faith to the, to the Gentiles. It's not just a Jewish thing. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you for your time and, and your attention. Uh, I know this is a busy, busy time of year, and uh, we'll, give you a, we'll give you a 21 and... No, 10 minutes of your life back, 11 minutes of your life back. <laughs>